Tile. Uh, welcome everyone. And on behalf of the David Thompson Foundation, I am Joanna and along, along with my friend and colleague Paula will be the moderators for today's Dr. Holter's webinar. I know we have a lot of frequent participants, but I will go briefly going over our housekeeping rooms, right? Uh, you may ask questions for the speaker during the presentation by using the Q&A box feature on the bottom of, of your screen. Please do not ask questions using the chat box. The questions will be taken after the end of each case for Dr. Holter address them. Um, time allowing. Uh, after the presentation, you will receive an email with the link uh, to a quick questionnaire to SurveyMonkey. Please uh, take a minute to respond. Your feedback is essential to help us improve our webinar series. Uh, we also uh, adopted a real time closed captions that you can see in the bottom of, of your screen. You may output by clicking on the up arrow of the live transcript button in the end and then hide subtitle. Well, uh, with um, further ado, it's a great joy that I can introduce you to our speakers for today's webinar. Dr. Kelly Holder is an associated pathology at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute and enjoys her days of wild animals and wilder lesions. A graduate of University of Florida's College of Veterinary Medicine, she completed her anatomic pathology residency at Louisiana State University and headed off to San Diego Zoo's Institute for Conservation Research for two years as a Fox doctoral associate. In addition of various graduate projects on killfish on gopher tortoise, Kelly engaged as in three year or fellowships at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, working both global health and pathology. Her office contained an assortment of antique lab equipment, bones, preserved specimens, and of course, snacks. In her spare time, she flips over logs, admires fungi, bikes unnecessary distance, and climbs trees, and makes a decadent sweet potato gnocchi. Dr. Holland, the podium is all yours. Thank you for having me. This is always a pleasure to do anything with the Davis Thompson Foundation. Um, I am a huge proponent of science communication in every way and love it when we as a community come together to just share knowledge on fun cases. And that is what I will be talking to y'all about today. And let's see if I can share the appropriate screen. All right, we have a Hopefully you're seeing the right screen. Yes, it's good. perfect. Wonderful. Okay, so the only thing these cases have in common is that they are weird, infectious, fun, and splashy. And that's, that's a whole mood, isn't it? Here we go. Let's talk about this American beaver. His name was Birch. He was a five-year-old intact male. The beavers, if you are not familiar with how huge they actually are, they are the largest rodent in North America, and they're second only to the capybara in the world. So they're a good-sized rodent. Fun facts about rodents, they can't vomit, and they have clavicles. This particular animal had a history of some social stress and was under uh, treatment with some anxiolytics and neuroleptics to keep him from being hostile to the other beaver in his enclosure. And it did not work. So they had to keep them separate. His keeper observations for the morning of his presentation was that he was in his den swimming around at an unexpected time. And then about, that was about three hours prior to his presentation. And then he was found floating in his pool dead at 1.30 p.m., which was just very unexpected and traumatic for everyone. He had a small amount of blood tinged fluid that was flowing from his oral cavity. And on postmortem radiographs, there was a consolidation of his left lung and perihilar region. He had a full stomach with increased gas in the GI, and um, they found normal findings of the transponder bones and everything else. So let's just have a look at this beaver. And I'm going to pause just so that you can form an initial impression. And hopefully, that initial impression is that he's a little bit bloated. Now, he's pretty fresh. But he is definitely bloated, and um, you can see that from the outside. And when you palpated this, it was taut like a drum, so you could just like boom, boom, boom on the outside. Opening it up, we're seeing this. So take a moment to see what you, your impressions are. Hopefully your impressions are 
not good. So on the left is where the head is and to the right is towards the tail. You can see the liver up at the top left. And you can already see that bad things are happening here. We've got fibrin, we've got injected serosa, and down there at the bottom, that's looking pretty suspicious. And I'm just gonna, yeah, tell you, that is in fact ingesta. The smell here also was very diagnostic. I opened this animal up and I immediately was reminded of my residency and a ruptured gastric horse, right? A stomach that had ruptured and a horse. So this is what that, that specific smell, that um, sour plant matter and, um, and feed matter that you smell when you open up when there's a, a gastric rupture in an herbivore. So I initially was already like, mm, I think that we have ruptured the stomach probably. And there was quite a bit of fluid in there and it was serosanguinous and had ingesta in it. And already I, I'm, I'm, I'm forming some opinions about why this animal has died. Sure enough, here's the stomach and you can see that just to, the, uh, the heads to the right on this one, just to, to orient you, that there are petechiations along the lesser curvature of the stomach. There are small hemorrhages in the liver and the rent is on the greater curvature of the stomach, which is where, the, where, where ruptures usually occur if they're going to occur in a stomach. You can also see that the, the tearing is larger in the serosal layer than it is in the, um, the submucosal layer. So the holding layer of the gut is the submucosa and that's what's going to be the the toughest layer to get through so the the serosa and muscularis are torn and you've got a big rent and then you've got a small hole through the submucosa and the um mucosa there there was blood on the outside of the stomach and i just want to to warn you if you uh if you're a trypophobic at all the next couple of slides might be difficult for you. So trypophobia, if you have problems with, with small holes, because there are some weird holes. We're gonna talk about some anatomy of a beaver. If you've never opened up a beaver, they have a cardiogastric gland that is towards the, um, the cardia of their stomach. And it has these big glandular openings and that is a normal structure of beavers. And if you are not expecting that, you will be freaked out when you see it in a beaver. So just to let you know that that is a normal structure. And on this one, you can see that the cardiogastric glands were still there, but you also have you know, hemorrhage and mucus kind of getting stopped up in there. It just doesn't look very healthy. The mucosa itself also looks pinker than it probably should. And there's, there's obviously hemorrhage in that mucosa. Once we opened it up a little bit more, you can see that there's, there's hemorrhage in a region of the mucosa and a hole in the mucosa. So if this were a horse, usually when they rip their stomach open, it is not because of a primary problem in the tissue of the stomach wall. In this case, we actually have damage to the stomach wall that probably contributed to weakening in that area. So we have now we're starting to divert from the pathogenesis of what we would usually see in a horse. So there's some, some sort of primary gastric pathology happening here. And as we were, had mentioned in the, in the history, he did have some consolidation of his lung on radiographs. And grossly, you can see that that left lung up there looks a bit mottled and red and like you've got some, some degree of pneumonia or hemorrhage or something going on in there. Probably not aspiration pneumonia because remember, rodents can't vomit. So here are our gross diagnoses. There was necrohemorrhagic gastritis. There was transmural rupture of the stomach. There was peritonitis. It was fibrinous. It was hemorrhagic. It was nasty. And then multifocal focal pulmonary hemorrhage and edema. It did leak uh, a serosanguinous fluid when, when it was cut. Hepatic hemorrhages and epicardial hemorrhage were also noted. So let's look at the histopathology, shall we? Here's the stomach. And you're already seeing that there's hemorrhage into the mucosa and it's, and it's forming these, these blebs into the mucosa. In other areas, what we saw, just like take a moment to see if you can see what's going on here. We have an infarct up here, nice wedge shape and, and loss of detail. So we've got some coagulative necrosis up there. It's surrounding a fibrin clot. So there's a thrombus in there. 
And then we also have these lovely um, emphysema bubbles. So now we're looking at, like I said, this is a different pathogenesis than just overeating and gas production. So we have infarcts and emphysema. We've got hemorrhage in the mucosa. And down in here, we're seeing that the hemorrhage and the emphysema are very close together. And you can see that there's compression of the tissue by the gas. Again, this was a very fresh case. So this is not just post-mortem edema. In here, you've got hemorrhage, and then you have that distal, that sort of apical necrosis that we're seeing. And note that there is a thrombus there. Up there on the apical surface, though, we've got maybe something else going on. So there's definitely some broken down blood and some pigment in there, but let's look a little bit closer as to what's going on up in here. A higher magnification, you can see that we have lots of pretty robust, but not like cadaver bug robust bacilli. And then we have these large tetrads. That's an unusual morphology to see in the, in the GI. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Again, you can see that these, these bacteria are just absolutely invading this tissue and, and replicating a lot. And then you've got those tetrads up there as well. Let's talk about our morphs. We've got a gastritis that's necrohemorrhagic and suppurative because there were neutrophils in there as well. It was emphysematous with multifocal ulceration and it had robust bacilli and tetrad cocci. The peritoneum had peritonitis, exactly what we'd expect. And then there was pulmonary hemorrhage and vasculitis, which is not an expected finding just for, for having a, a gastric rupture. All right. The gross presentation was initially very similar to what you would see, again, in an equine gastric rupture. And the pathogenesis for that one is that they both are animals that can't vomit, both equines and rodents. So anything that caused delayed gastric emptying puts them at risk of gas fermentation and then just volume overload and rupture. However, we also had gross evidence of necrotizing gastritis, which is uncommon in horses, not impossible, but is not the most common cause of gastric rupture in horses. Remember that this animal was under treatment for social stress and is a species that eats wood. So had a lot of opportunities to have either ulcers or micro abrasions or even little lacerations into the mucosa. The necrosis and the histological findings are much more similar to what you'd see in, in a hemorrhagic abomac abomacitis in young ruminants, where they have a traumatic ulcer or traumatic uh, situation or ulcer in the mucosa, and then Clostridium or sarcenal organisms overgrow and damage the gastric vasculature, slow the gastric motility, damage the wall, hemorrhage and gas production in the wall, fermentation in the union, uh, lumen, stomach, stomach tympany, and rupture. I mentioned sarcina. We're going to talk a little bit more of, or, uh, about that organism. So this kind of is very similar to what you would see in a hemorrhagic epimacitis situation. So braxy is another clostridial disease that can cause hemorrhage and gastritis, but usually the cause of death for braxy is sudden death due to enterotoxemia rather than from the um, abomacitis or from rupture itself. Um, it doesn't usually cause rupture because usually it kills the animal before it gets to, this, to the point of rupture, but you'll often find hemorrhagic abomacitis as a lesion of braxy. The classic hemorrhagic abomacitis is more emphysematous and you're gonna get a tympanic, like a very swollen, full of air um, abomasum in these rodents. And the distension is a really a key feature of your typical um, Clostridium sordelli abomasitis. Note that C. septicum, the cause of Braxy, is a normal inhabitant of the gut flora, whereas C. sordelli is not. It's usually only found in the soil and should not be in the organism, the host at all. So it, it's more of a it's more of a saprinosis kind of situation. More than just C. sordelli can cause hemorrhagic abomasitis. Really, any clostridium can do this, but it's, it's the, the classic one. Sarcina and sarcina-like organisms are gram-positive tetrads. And that's what we were seeing when we saw those, those tetrads. So that's just an organism to be aware of. Um, it's 
it can cause the same thing as this, uh, as, as most of your clostridiums uh, on, your clostridia on these uh, hemorrhagic abomasitis type situations. And it's been reported in humans as well. Probably not zoonotic, but just the same organism doing similar things in animals. In humans, it's a known cause of emphysematous, specifically emphysematous gastritis, which frequently causes ruptures in humans. And it's usually in geriatric patients and has a 60 to 80% mortality. So it's a pretty terrible disease. Um, so this was just a really interesting case where the beginning looked like one taxon and the end looked like a different uh, disease and a different taxon. But knowing your, your domestic animal diseases is really what helps you understand the pathogenesis of this case. Because I don't know about you, but I haven't seen a lot of beavers. I've done a handful, right? I've done fewer than 10 beavers in my life. Um, but knowing my, my domestic animal diseases was really helpful for, for understanding that case. And it was, it was really a slam dunk um, because we had all of that all the way through. Lots of, lots of good lesions. Do we have any questions on that case? No, we do not. Okay. Please. For for those who are beaver taxonomy purists, the picture right now is a European beaver that's smaller and different from a North American beaver, but they are still cute. Uh, so so you still get the picture. And little young beavers, they're really adorable. All right, our next one will be. <laughs> you do look like Ewoks. Yay. Um, so our next one is going to be this lovely Philippine crocodile. She was nicknamed Penelope by our students. And she was a 27-year-old female Philippine crocodile. She was small for her age and species. And she presented to us with conjunctivitis and deviation of her left eye. So if you don't know a whole lot about this species, they have an average lifespan between 70 and 80 years. So she was not particularly old for her species. This, this species is obviously native to the Philippines, but it's now only found in fragmented islands near the main big islands of the Philippines. And they're mostly fish, aquatic invertebrates, small mammal ears, um, little, little small animal generalists, basically. So here's Penelope's eye, and you can see that that was concerning. There was ocular deviation and conjunctivitis and pretty significant scleral injection with moderate to severe uveitis visible right through the, the cornea. On CT, she had a periocular mass with invasion into the posterior chamber of the eye and severe bilateral pulmonary disease. So she had both eye problems and lung problems. She was treated with uh, meloxicam and cefteofer and was prepped for a nucleation. So you can see her there on the surgical table, ready to go, very dramatic lighting. And this was one of the coolest biopsies I've ever gotten because I got this giant eye from a crocodile. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's fun. Um, so you can see right here, I'm actually gonna show you histologically, but grossly, this is a really good image of the nictitans over the eye. And you can see that it's clear. And that nictitans histologically looks quite similar to cornea. And we'll see that on the, on the histology, but it's just really fun to see that it's, it has that nice, nice clear layer there. So here it is fixed. And you can see that we have a huge mass penetrating into the rear of the eye, the posterior chamber of the eye, and it's occupying about 75% of the posterior chamber. And it's lobulated, mottled tan, and just what a fun biopsy. Unfortunately, this biopsy became a necropsy as she died overnight post-nucleation. So going straight into necropsy findings, cranial is towards the right, caudal is towards the left, and in the middle, I'm showing where you can actually identify some of the favular lung. So it has that net-like surface of the lung. It doesn't have an alveolar spongy all the way through architecture you can, you can see on the surface. It was a little hyperinflated in that spot because the rest of her lung was completely consolidated and the wall of her lung was very thickened. So this is the surface of her lung, and this is where her lung was adhered to the body wall, and underneath it was this huge plaque. 
And you can see the rest of her, her lung is, again, quite consolidated, has these miliary foci all through it. And when we get into that, it, it penetrates. It's not just a plaque. It penetrates all the way into the lung. And it's this laminated caseous core, which is really exciting as a pathologist, but really terrible for her. Um, and it's going to get worse because this is what her uh, lung looks like on the inside. So let's just think about all of the things that this could be. It doesn't look particularly mm, cellular in terms of, doesn't look like it's a growth of the epithelial cells. So it's probably not neoplastic. This is looking more infectious to me. It's got a lot of mucus going on there. So it's a very reactive change. And that granularity looks granulomatous to me. Of course, it's a reptile. They love to make granulomas. They prefer making granulomas over literally anything else. And our top causes of granulomatous disease in reptiles are going to be mycobacterium, obviously. Um, but you also have to consider other bacteria, fungi, um, unusual for, for viruses to cause significant granulomatous disease and like laminated granulomas. But Secondary bacterial infections are not impossible. All right, I know you wanna see the histo in this. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Just to give you an orientation of normal anatomy and histology of an eye, if you haven't seen a lot of them, the cornea is on the anterior surface. We've got these nice leaflets here. And notice that in this species, we have hyaline cartilage in the sclera over here. Right? So we've got a nice, rigid, but flexible eyeball. And then in the center there, you've got remains of the lens, which, of course, fractured. And this is her left eye. It was pretty nasty. Up, up top, just to, again, there, the, uh, the comparison between the cornea and the nictitans, you can actually see that they look very similar. It's just the nictitans is one layer out, and it's quite clear. But focusing on the back of this eye, it's just all granuloma all the time. And I'm curious about what's in there. I hope you are. There's also the fact that it displaced the lens forward. So the lens hit the back of the iris. And you can see that there was actually a posterior synechia. And the way that you can tell is that a bunch of the pigmented cells, um, and you even see that that cell still has some some architecture left, um, we're stuck to the front of that lens. So that lets you know that there was there was a true anterior synechia because once you start moving the eye around, it can be really hard to, to judge on histopathology whether something was in vivo actually synechia. And here we've got these beautiful granulomas and anybody training for boards right now, I'm sure you can just rattle off that beautiful description of a granuloma. We've got um, central necrotic debris, we've got multinucleated epithelioid macrophages, we've got surrounded, oh, nope, come back. We've got surrounded, it's surrounded by those, um, the, the lymph, lymphoid cells and um, fibrous connective tissue, reactive fibroblasts in there. So we've got all of that going on. It's lovely, beautiful layers. And on PAS, we're starting to see little fragments. So we've got cellular debris, but here we've got at the end of our arrows, these beautiful little fragments of hyphae in here. And that's just, that's very rewarding, I think. And then of course we've got giant gnats. So some places were just tiny little fragments, but it's worth looking around because some places you've got these huge mats, lots of branching septate hyphae all through this, the necrotic debris in the center of these granulomas. Switching over to the lungs, um, we've got colonies of bacteria, and you can see that they're, they're I mean, they're, they're clearly replicating in the lung, and then at the edge of this whole necrotic schmoo, you've got these multinucleated giant cells. And I think there was a, a question about Langhans cells. Yes, some of them are forming the ring arrangement of a Langhans style multinucleated giant cell. I still haven't seen a good convincing argument on why it would be important for it to be mentioned, whether they're Langhans or foreign body type other than as a descriptor. But it's a good descriptor to have in your back pocket to know what people are talking about. Um, and here in the lung, we can see that we have both the 
we've got both the, the bacteria and the fungus both in the same spot. On the top, we've got the fungus, and on the bottom, we've got those colonies of bacteria. It's pretty miserable to be this animal's lungs. We remember what they looked like grossly. On gram stain, these were gram negative bacteria. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these organisms. Um, culture wise, we did culture this, obviously, and the culture was Pseudomonas aeruginosa for the bacteria, and then the fungus, not sure if you've heard of it, but it's Purpurea cilium lilacinum. And I'm just going to call it P. lilacinum from now on. So this particular fungus used to be called Paleomyces or Paciliomyces lilacinus, and it is a ubiquitous saprophyte in the soil and water, and water that's contaminated with biological material, especially like old food, is a really common medium for this stuff to grow in. It's a big problem in, um, in areas where they're doing aquaculture, basically, of crocodilians, which is pretty common in East Asia and also in places in the Southeast United States. Humid, wet, biologically contaminated areas are at high risk for this particular um, fungus, and of course a crocodile enclosure could be all of those things. The characteristics of the hyphae are that they're you know, two and a half microns to four microns in diameter, and you can see that they're beautifully filamentous. This is a lovely picture that I got off of a, uh, a retired, I believe he was a, a technician or a technologist uh, blog. He loves taking pictures of microbial organisms and good for him, thank you. So they're, they're these beautiful long septate hyphae and they're not bulbous at all. They're just all these very filamentous and fairly parallel walls, but they do curve quite a lot. You can see in this picture that we've got quite a, quite a few curvatures and they're not always the same diameter. So they shift from everything from here all the way up to kind of thicker bits. The fungal mats, we're covering pulmonary tissue or air sacs. And, and um, if you get them on like an air sac or some, a flat surface where you're getting a good growth, where you're getting a really good, really just a colony, they'll have kind of a, a pinkish hue. So that's why they have the name P. lilacinum. All right, so our morphologic diagnoses were pneumonia, granulomatous and heterophilic, diffuse, severe, with intralesional fungal mats and colonies of gram-negative bacteria, which were cultured as Perpurocilium lilacinum and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, respectively. And then the eye, panophthalmitis, and retrobulbar myof myofasciitis, granulomatous and heterophilic, severe, with intralesional mats of fungi. All righty. Let's talk a little bit about the pathogenesis here. This is ubiquitous, as mentioned, and it's, it's in the environment and it's commonly found in individuals with certain risk factors. Crowding is obviously gonna be a risk factor just because you've got more hosts, you've got more biological material being put into the water. Um, anything that stresses an animal out, so changes in the water quality, changes in the, the density, any change in the ventilation, especially decreased ventilation. And if the animal has any other systemic illness, that's going to definitely affect them. This is considered a saponosis, and I used that word before, and I'm going to specifically call attention to it. It is a disease caused by a pathogen from the environment rather than transmitted from another infectious host. So we talk about zoonoses all the time, and you know that, that tells you sort of that it's going between animals and people. Sapronosis means it's coming from the environment. Fungal diseases are usually sapronoses. They're not frequently contagious, except for your, your dermatophila and things like that, you know, your, your dermatomycoses. The P. lilacinum caused a chronic pneumonia with secondary infection of pseudomonas, and there was a hematogenous spread to the eye. I like to do these lovely blown up understandings of how the underlying pathology worked together to cause the clinical signs. And um, so we think that this animal had an under, had underlying stressors and was um, managed to gain this infection. We have seen this, this particular fungus in some of our tortoises where it's causing like some, some flaking of the scoots. It's not, doesn't seem to be affecting their cause, their, their quality of life at all. They, 
don't seem to care a whole lot, but it it did obviously really affect this, this animal. So we have any questions on this case? Uh, we have two questions. Uh, well, we have uh, of, uh, Stephanie, and she's asking if you perform uh, acid fast on the eye section. I did, and there were no acid fast bacteria in there, but that is an excellent differential and worth considering in any significant granulomatous disease in a reptile or bird, um, because there's, there's no reason why this couldn't be a multifactorial infection. And it was multifactorial in the lung. But yeah, in, in both the lung and the eye, there were no acid fast um, organisms. But it's, it's an excellent thing. You have to, you have to rule it out. You, you could not sign this case out without having at least checked. Sure, thank you. And actually, uh, it's actually, she's made a, a fun, fun question here. She um, wants to know how do you do to know which animal have heterophil or neutrophils? Uh, she's interested to hear if anyone has a favorite go to so her source. If no, she can sense maybe spread the sheet. <laughs> I personally, I go by taxonomy and appearance of the cells in tissue. And um, so, with my reptiles, I just default to it's a heterophil unless it's particularly pale looking. Um, in amphibians, it, it's a little bit a little bit uh, dicier because things like frogs frequently have neutrophils. But if it's pink and it's in a non-mammal, I'm I will call it a heterophil unless I have really good confidence that it is it has really round granules and I can distinguish between the heterophils and the eosinophils in that case and if I'm gonna just sit on a fence because we pathologists love to sit on a fence I will totally call it a granulocyte I am not above that it doesn't I, I have no ego in making sure that I'm um correct on on calling it an, an eosinophil I'll call it a granulocyte it's definitely a granulocyte and it gets the information across that I don't know in this species because I see so many species that like I don't I don't have good references on. Ooh, perfect. <laughs> and my my colleague Lauren Piper is piping up with pathology of zoo and wildlife animals has a table on page sixty seven in chapter four. So there you go, memorize that. Also, people argue about it. People are like, elephants have heterophils. Elephants have neutrophils. They're just really pink, and. You know what I meant. Perfect. We love it for sure. Yeah. I honestly don't think it matters super much if you're calling it a heterophil versus a neutrophil if you are if you are confident in you're distinguishing that from an eosinophil. Yeah, perfect. Uh, we have also another question uh, from Etsy. Uh, do you know by any chance the medial and growth conditions of this fungi in your culture? That is a good microbiology question. And I will say that uh, there is a paper by Wellahan on this organism that probably touches on that. And if not, he knows, you could just ask him. But yeah, I, I would I would look into literature on that one. I do not know off the top of my head what, what medium this likes to grow on. Alrighty. Yeah, uh, we have another one. Uh, Gabrielle wants to know if they have a uh, neutrophilic or lymphocyte uh, immune response. I mean, they don't have a neutrophilic response. They don't have neutrophils, um, but they do have. A, yeah, they, I mean, they can they can have granulocytes respond to things that are acute, and if they can clear that, then it's not going to form a granulomatous response. Um, same thing that they can have some chronic things where you'll get a lymphocytic response. It's just that anything that isn't cleared quickly by their um, their heterophils and isn't low grade enough to be like that low grade chronic that that lymphocytes. I there there are other responses. It's just most of the time, by the time a pathologist gets into it and wants to talk about it, it's a granulomatous response. Perfect. Let me just see. Uh, we have a. Oh, yeah. I um, like the term eosinophilic granulocytes for fish a lot. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because they're not eosinophils, but they're pink. But I'll often just say they're other heterophils. Yeah. Granulocytes. Yeah. Perfect. I think we can carry on, Doc. All right. So let's let's go to fish, shall we? Um, one of the most fun named fish that we have showed up, found dead, no banjo. And uh, and I was very sad about that because, like I said, they're they're a neat little fish. They're part of our Amazonia collection, so they're a freshwater catfish, and they have a shape that is somewhat reminiscent of a banjo with a big bulbous body and a long tail. The splotching on them is normal. That is that is their their sort of cryptic coloration. And I opened her up, and you can see that she's got an egg mass in there, big gelatinous ovaries, no obvious fat and grossly no clear cause of death. So I don't always have a good clear cause of death. I had some good good gross findings on those first two cases, but with fish, a lot of times, um, I'm noting things grossly and really solidifying them on histopathology. So I didn't want you to think that I've always had a great idea of, from gross. This is a fish, I'm like, it's fish, yes it is. It's a female fish, it's opened up, mm-hmm. Cool, let's look at the histo. This is um, a non-specific change that I see quite a bit in, um, not quite a bit. I see it occasionally in fish, but it's always a good thing to keep an eye out for, especially if you're doing tox path with fish. But if you don't see a lot of fish, this is um, this is a gill aneurysm and there's some thrombosis in there. So just keep an eye out for this. It's a non-specific finding. Usually means that their gills are irritated by something. A lot of times that's water quality or um, another systemic thing that's just kind of irritating them. But keep an eye out for it because it is something that's it's good to have on your radar and be able to put into a report. Another fun thing that is fairly incidental to this case, but this is a vessel and you can see that it's got big, you know, clear cells in the uh, layer, of the muscular layer of the artery. And these animals can get both atherosclerosis and myxomatous degeneration of heart and vessels. So don't assume that that is just a mammal thing. You can absolutely find that in fish. It is a it is a significant problem in tetras where they'll get endocardiosis and things like that. But just keep an eye out for it in your in your fish, especially the older ones. So there's a little bit of vacuolar degeneration in the heart here as well. And then over in the ovary, we had this lovely little thrombus here had the layers. I love it when they have layers. So it's a very photogenic little thrombus. So clearly this animal has some systemic stuff going on. A random focus of necrosis in the liver. So again, signs of some level of systemic disease. All right, now we're in the kidney. Now, if you don't look at a lot of kidneys on fish, that's totally fine. Um, fish tend to have a lot more interstitial cellularity than in mammals or birds or reptiles because they do a significant amount of hem hematopoiesis in between those tubules. If they have a head kidney, most of that's gonna, you know, there's gonna be more of that in the head kidney, but even in the trunk kidney, you will have a little bit more cellularity than you would expect. So some cellularity, totally fine. This level of cellularity, cellularity is increased, however. So this is a trunk kidney. There are glomeruli in this uh, section, not in this picture, but in this section. So this is part of the trunk kidney um, and it should not have um, this much. Um, and we have some evidence of disease. So we've got tubular necrosis in a couple of different spots. We've got some mineralization and pigment accumulation in the, the tubules. Remember in freshwater fish, their kidneys are not trying to really concentrate anything. In fact, if anything, they are trying to dump fresh water and retain salt. And of course, something's going on in this collecting duck and it does not look great. Let's think about what that could be. Well, we've got two things going on here. One, we've got bacteria. Those are definitely bacteria. Those are definitely in the collecting duct. And these guys, who are they? Oh, we've got spores. We've got like big fluffy things. They've, they've, got, they've got fringy bits. They brought a fringe. Who are these? These are a mixosporidial, a mixosporidian parasite. This is very consistent with the appearance of the ortholoniidae 
but I'm not an expert on all of the taxonomy of these guys. And there are a lot that keep getting discovered. So if I'm not up to date and somebody wants to correct me, totally, that's fine. Um, so they look kind of protozoal, but they are not protozoal. These are these are mixospiridia. They are they are jellyfish pretending to be protozoa. We will still call the big um, moving around forms trophozoites, just like if they were a protozoan, but they're not. The, the, it's the amoebic form that's going to be able to move around, and then they do pro, pro, produce these spores. So. This particular organism is considered coelozoic. So coelozoic, C-O-E-L-O-Z-O-I-C. And that means that it is reproducing and replicating in a cavity. So in this case, inside the tubule. So it's technically outside the tissue of the fish, right? So this is communicating with the outside, as opposed to the histozoic types that are going to be in the tissue where you're going to form a cyst. So these spores that are produced right here are infectious to the next host, but they are not infectious to other fish. And I just, I love the pictures of these guys with their little um, hold fast fringes. So they're pseudopodia like, if you like. I'm gonna go through just some really pretty pictures of what these look like on different stains because they can help you nail down that this is in fact mixosporidium. You can see those those lovely little little fringes. This is a gram stain and they're not showing up super great but you can see that the complexity of the interior is is kind of showing up. It also shows you that those bacteria are gram negative. So we've got a gram negative bacterial infection and this mixosporidium infection. Alrighty. Now we're still in the gram stain, you can start to see that some of these um, spores have a little bit of a gram negative uh, outline, but most importantly, each of them has this really, really densely dark set of um, polar capsules. Different mixosporidia will have different number of polar capsules, but the polar capsules are the things that contain the polar filaments, and polar filaments are basically the nidocysts, so like I said, this is kind of like a jellyfish or a coral or another cnidarian. They have nematocysts or um, stabby harpoon cells that envenomate things, right? So these are actually used to grab onto other cells and kind of reel it in. And that's how, how these spores get to their next host is once they're on the tissue, they just uh, harpoon them, which is not disturbing at all and they're highly gram positive. All right, so this is a Zeal-Nielsen stain. So this is acid fast, and you can see that those, those, those polar capsules are quite acid fast. And when you have the histozoic mixozoans, that acid fast stain is just gonna be absolutely beautiful because the, the, the cysts are gonna be packed full of the spore form, and you're gonna see a lot of these lighting up on acid fast, so that's nice. This is PAS, I just love PAS stains. It's not particularly helpful for this organism, but it is very pretty. You can see the, the fibrillar pseudopodia uh, pretty well on PAS. So I do like that. And you do see the complexity of the inside, but it isn't particularly diagnostic for anything else on this one. And here we are with the Gimsa. And for the same reason that the gram stain is, is very gram positive, the Gimsa stain, this is a, it's it's got that nice dark polar capsules because it's basically it's a methylene blue reactive tissue so they they show up really nicely if you have not seen this particular um life cycle put it into your brain just keep it in here just just put it in here tell you that the vertebrate host is the intermediate host. And I am unconvinced. Um, I think that we have sufficient evidence that in many species, sexual reproduction happens in both the invertebrate and the vertebrate host. So if sexual reproduction is happening in both, then both of them are definitive hosts, as far as I am concerned, that that is the definition of a definitive host, you are doing sexual reproduction. So 
they have this actinospore life stage life stage coming out of the that invertebrate host and that is what the fish is going to encounter in its environment there's also a spore stage off of this um so there's there's both an actinospore and a and a regular like little spore stage that is in between here that's just not shown here uh but yeah another thing to note is again it's a, it's, a, it's a required two-stage life cycle. If all you have are fish and you do not have the, the host, which is usually an oligochaete or another annelid worm, but some bryozoans can also be um, hosts. If you don't have that, that other host, you're not going to infect, infect other fish. They are not directly infectious to other fish. They have to go through that other host. And if you look at them under a microscope at very, very high magnification, sometimes you can see a suture line. So you can see that here, it's been depicted. So it's, they have, it's like a clamshell is how they're kind of organized. So when you look straight down at them, you'll see these lovely um, polar capsules. If you have electron microscopy, you might be able to see the filament. They might have a big vacuole back here. And then if you look at them from the other perpendicular angle, you'll see the seam of the clamshells, and that's the suture line. And those are actually attenuated cells. So this is a, even the spore is a multicellular organism. So people originally thought that these were unicellular versions of a multicellular organism, and they're not. They're actually multicellular. And um, yeah, so this is this is the life stage. They They get into the fish. They come out of the GI of the fish and they get to some other place in the fish. And then the spores somehow manage to either get out the GI or in this case, probably out the urine, or they insist in the muscle tissue. And then when the fish dies and is ingested by something else, like these detritivores, which are your oligochaetes, are great cleanup crew, right? So they're gonna get it straight out of the muscle. It's not gonna necessarily be, um, it doesn't have to be pooped out. It can be can be eaten straight from the muscle, just kind of like toxoplasma cysts and other AP complexins that form sporocysts. All right. So they're a weird little organism and I kind of love them. It's just a it's just a wild taxon and they're very photogenic. So do we have any questions on these? Noting that they are really weird. No, we do not have any questions. Well, then this, uh, this image is from a blog post entitled The Disappointing Reality of Musical Fish, with the quote, fanciful common names of fishes suggest there may be an orchestra in the sea, but this is another way the underwater world lets us down. This guy was real spicy about fish. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and we can go to just, just regular questions. Yeah, we have now a question here on the Q&A box. Um, it's Ryan. Uh, sorry if I missed this, but what stage of the Mycososporian had the fringe again? The fringe was the trophozoite, which is the, um, the kind of amoebic stage of the fish living portion of the organism. So it's called a trophozoite, just like it would be in, um, in, in many of your protozoa. Sweet. We have a lot of uh, compliments, people saying thank you. I don't know, guys, have you, uh, anyone had uh, any questions? This is the time. Please don't be shy. Dr. Holder is here for our learning. Yeah, I usually take a lot longer on this because I, I encourage people to interrupt me, but it's very hard on a web webinar for people to interrupt me. Um, so if you have questions or if you want to see any images again, I'm happy to happy to do that. Sure. If you don't mind, also, Dr. Holder, you can maybe um, share your email with uh, our oh yeah our audience, and then can also email you. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Prazana wants to know if any on of these cases, any agent could be a potential zoonotic ag agent. Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, so with the Myxospiridians, no, there have not been any reported zoonotic Myxospiridians from 
fish that I'm aware of. Um, they have a pretty pretty tight like back and forth between the 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 fish and um, oligochaete lifestyle. In fact, terrestrial ones have been identified, but they're just not very common compared to the, the aquatic ones. With regards to the other cases, I don't consider um, perprocilium to be a zoonotic agent. Like I said, it's a saponosis. I'm not saying you could never be infected by it, but you're probably not going to get it from a crocodile. You're probably, if you had a cut or something and you were really stressed out and maybe had something immunosuppressing you and it got into the cut, you could get an infection, a local infection. Um, but I would not expect you to have, I, I wouldn't consider it a, a risk for you to be around an animal infected with that. And with the clostridia, obviously, um, it's still more still more saponotic than than zoonotic for most of those. Um, you probably have to like make an effort to get clostridium from an animal. Um, and sarcina again is is more saponotic than than what I would consider zoonotic. So. Uh, I would consider these all very low, low risk in terms of zoonosis, but not no risk for humans because saponoses are all around us all the time. Jay! Yay! Yeah. Yay. So cool for doing. Well, it was awesome, of course, as always. And thank Dr. Holder for giving us this great presentation. She always puts on a very good show uh, and brings cool cases. Uh, so thank you so much. And thanks everybody for attending. And just wanted to just sort of remind everybody that, you know, that the these types of events, these free seminars are, are due to the generosity of our speakers and the generosity of all of our volunteers. There's so much going on behind the scenes, you know, that you guys don't realize. And so just remember that and, and give them a, a shout out and a thanks. And, you know, remember that all of this stuff gets paid for by our institutional memberships and our individual memberships and our corporate sponsorships and all of those good things. So thank our volunteers and, and thank all of our members. And if you're not a member through your institution, consider becoming a member and they're great. go to the courses, they're support great. the foundation. Yes. And I, I want to specifically thank the, uh, the trainees that helped me <laughs> um, despite some technical difficulties that I was having with my computer earlier with this week, being super patient and wonderful and being wonderful moderators for this. Thanks, Shawana. Thanks, well, everybody. Thank you, everyone who attended. Y'all are great. I wish I'd brought more cases. I, I thought this was going to take longer. <laughs> yeah. Actually, right. we have uh, three more uh, questions if oh, you want yes. to take them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, David want to know if you ever see the release pneumocyst in a section. If I see what? A pneumatocyst, pneumocyst. Uh, the pneumatocyst in section. They're pretty small. Um, so that's going to be the, the actual, other than the, than seeing the, the polar, um, the polar capsule, which contains it. Um, you're not going to really see it in histological section, or at least I, I'm not going to see it in histological section. Maybe you will. Uh, I probably won't. It, it usually is not visible or is so small that you're only going to see it on, on electron microscopy. So I, I'm not holding my breath to see those. Um, you're really just going to see the capsules. Perfect. Uh, Sara wants to know if these guys could kill the fish now. So that's actually a good question. This particular uh, group, the, the Ortholoniidae, is not considered highly pathogenic, and probably this animal died from the bacterial infection that was the secondary infection. Um, so we had signs of thrombosis and multi multifocal necrosis in other organs, and that leads me to believe that this animal was septic from the bacterial infection. But the um, but the Ortholoniidae is a is sort of like contributes to unthriftiness but doesn't generally kill the animal now other mixosporidia other other organisms can be quite deadly and many of them are economically important so like mixobolus and things like that you're going to see hanagaya um, those are going to be much more dangerous to the animal this particular group is not a high mortality species or taxon, I should say, because I'm almost three years ago. Yeah, so aligning with this question, Katze wants to know if there is any treatment um, for this 
Yeah, I have not run across anything that looked like good treatment. Now, granted, my my lifestyle is not one where I do a lot of treating on, on account of there are much better trained people for that. But treatment is not what I'm so treatment is not really what I do, but also um removing the intermediate host tends to be the best management practice. So if you have control of the the animal in care, so you actually have control of the environment, this is not a wildly managed uh, population, doing things to reduce or remove the annelids that are the potential intermediate hosts, those are gonna be how you manage this condition. Um, they're animals, right? So these are internal parasites and we do not yet have really good treatments for your animal has another animal in it. Um, just, just because a lot of the things that would work on a, uh, say like a nematode, aren't going to work because they're going to focus on cuticle. These guys don't have the same cuticle. They don't have this, they're, they're not muscular. So anything that, that interrupts like neuromuscular stuff is not going to work on them. Um, they, they have different enough biology that they're not similar enough to the things we have preventatives for. And they're similar enough to other animals that you're not going to just be able to put a, a general toxin on them. So treatment for them is really hard. So yeah, Esteban tells, told us that the jellyfish live in the kidneys. This is absolutely wild. She, <laughs> she he's thanking for you the your info. your fish. Yeah. So yeah. cnidarians that try to be protozoans. It's wild. And and for many many years, these were um, identified kind of like you see in fungi, the 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 actinospore form with the with the rays. Um, was considered one taxonomy. And then this parasite was considered a whole different thing. And sometimes the forms that were in the annelids were considered a different species. So it took, it took molecular phylogeny to really be able to figure out that actually there's all of these things are the same species. Can you imagine how mind blowing that was to be like, oh, actually this thing in this fish, this thing in this worm, and this thing that looks like a baby jellyfish look are the same thing, which I don't know if anybody reads a lot of sci-fi, but like this gave me some very strong speaker for the dead vibes, which is an Orson Scott card thing. We're like becoming a whole other organism, like just, just so, so different went from having a spore to just like being a whole jellyfish. It, what, what? Okay, they're not a jellyfish, but they're another fully, a fully actualized cnidarian. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. The Geneva wants to know, uh, since the most of these cases are saponotic, um, they are usually ubiquitous. Uh you think um could be like maybe a change in the habitat or cleaning that could improve, maybe or like prevent those diseases? Yeah, so some of it some of it is is I mean, obviously we we try to do our best on making sure that we have a lovely clean habitat for all of our animals, but also overcleaning can cause major dysfunctions in, um, in the microbiome basically of the environment. So you, you have to balance those two things between having, having a clean but vibrant, right? A, a naturalistic habitat and a versus a like sterile environment that is going to be uh, potentially quite chronically irritating to your your organisms and this this aquatic animals specifically all face that at a very at a very intimate level right they're bathed in a medium that is biologically permissive in a way that terrestrial animals aren't right we're in air there are organisms in the air but it's not particularly biologically permissive compared to being in soil or in water. Um, so that balance between how much do we clean versus how much do we try and maintain a balanced ecosystem is really important. And um, and sometimes there's, there's casualties. Um, 
also you have to remember that a lot of these animals aren't dying from other more acute things they're dying from like in, in this case like the, the mixosporidium it's a saprinosis but the animal didn't die of the mixosporidium it probably died of the ascending bacterial infection into its kidneys which any of us could get that at any time um so it probably didn't help and it did predispose the animal but probably wasn't dying from that um, the perforocilium, like we actually, that was one of our um, cases that that made us, like we, we're, we've always been concerned about ventilation in the area where that animal was. And that was a specific thing that we could point to and say, we need to prioritize, we need to get prioritized funding on that ventilation because like, that's a risk factor for this specific disease that this specific animal had. And so, um, yes, yes, there are things that can be done to try and improve stuff. And we are, and that's one of the, one of the great things about pathology is that that's the evidence that sometimes, sometimes what you need is ammunition to be able to make a change. And pathology is great ammunition to be able to say, here, here are the pictures of what happens. Um, you know, it's not, not a one one size fits all fix but if you can say this is a disease where ventilation plays a role we would like funding to improve the ventilation in this area here are pictures um that could be a really powerful application for pathology and um, advocacy for animal welfare pathology is a huge part of that sure so, well, we have a lot of uh, compliments here on our webinar. People were so oh, exciting. Fill out, the fill out the survey. Yeah, fill out the survey, everybody. Thank you. And well, we, it was a really nice and engaging lecture. I think everybody was super uh, happy with this. The animal in animal disease for sure was like our highlight here. Everybody's like asking Hi. about it. Everybody loves a good wildlife case. Yeah, uh, you will receive the survey link through the email uh, with your um, certificate. So please don't, don't let's not rush on it. And once again, I want to thank you, Dr. Holder, for this amazing lecture. I, I'm sure that everybody was super happy. Thank you for donating uh, your time and helping us with our mission. And it was my pleasure to be here. Soon. Yay. I hope to see you again soon. Take care. Sure. Thank you. Bye, Fish everybody. Are cool. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. I have to, I have to echo that. Fish are cool. All yeah. Right. Take care. Cool. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye, Bye all. Have a good weekend.